Howdy, and welcome to the White Hat Law Show with Warren Nord, where we cover a mix of current events, politics, and the law. Take it away, Warren. Welcome back to White Hat Law. I'm Warren Norrid, and we're filming down here in beautiful downtown Fort Worth. Uh, and today I've got with me the district attorney, Sharon Wilson. Just so you know, I've known Sharon about a thousand years. <laughs> well, maybe not quite that long. Um, late Close. 90s? Yes. She's already 90. a judge, maybe mid 90s. Uh, we had just started working on Arlington Classics Academy, and Sharon volunteered, sort of. <laughs> to uh, to help us out with that as its original board of directors mm -hmm. when we were first getting board uh, managers getting that going at the early days and so didn't have to do that but and she was out of her comfort zone but she actually Plus. worked and so I've always wanted to plug Sharon whenever we can uh, Sharon is the district attorney of of uh, Tarrant County and if you were like me sometimes you wonder what does that person do <laughs> and so I've asked Sharon to first. Uh, say, by the way, I wanted to ask you about something else. You know, you're always supposed to talk about things that people do. On your, on your list of things you've done, I see the Beautiful Feet Homeless Outreach Cook. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that as you say hello. So, um, for several years, I was the um, Beautiful Feet, I was the cook. It, it's a homeless shelter on the short south side of Fort Worth, right? Uh, near Allen. And, um, and I was the the fifth Sunday cook, which, you know, it sounds like, oh, I was so committed, but there's only like five Sundays in the year, maybe four times, right? So I was the fifth Sunday cook, but I did it for several years. And, and I actually took my daughter as she was growing up. We took other friends whose kids needed to get, you know, their volunteer hours for high school. And it was just a wonderful opportunity to um, cook and serve people and actually at the beautiful feet they start off on Sunday mornings cooking um, breakfast for you know 150 people and then turn around and cook lunch immediately after that for that uh, same 150 to 200 sometimes and serve it and then clean up and then we're out of there for the day but it, it it's great and um, I kind of miss it. I actually don't do it anymore. As soon as I started this job, which pretty much takes up all my time, I uh, stopped doing that. Well, you've got, of course, you've been involved in things all over Tarrant County for a long, long time. And so I was pleased to see you taking this spot. Was it 2014? Yes. Something like that? I, want, so. I took the office in January 2015. 2015. Okay. So you won in 2014. Yes. So, um, well, thank you. So, first of all, for I'll be self-anointed representative for all of Tarrant County. I'll say <laughs> thank you for your work. Um, tell us, what does the district attorney's office do? So, it's really kind of interesting because, of course, it's about law. Um, and actually, in Tarrant County, I'm a criminal district attorney. So, without getting too much in the weeds, um, there in, in law, there are county attorneys, district attorneys, and criminal district attorneys. Houston has a district attorney and a county attorney. And that means that the district attorney does all the felony cases, the state violations, and the county attorney does the misdemeanor county violations and represents the county on okay. the civil side. So when those two things combine, it's a criminal DA's office. That's what we have here in Tarrant County, and it's what we have in Dallas County next door. So we're actually CDAs. It doesn't matter. Everybody calls it DA. It doesn't matter really. But legally, we do not just all the criminal prosecution for all the cases that occur in Tarrant County, but also we represent every elected official, the county itself when they sue or get sued. So we actually have a very vibrant civil division. Our office also has 48 uh, police officers. We've got an investigative division that doesn't do initial investigations. I mean, when a crime occurs, you need to call 911. You need to deal with the police. Uh, but when we get ready to go to trial, which can be a year, sometimes two years later, we have to find those witnesses, get ready, make sure the evidence is all ready for the trial. And that's what those investigators do. So we also add to that another 103 or so staff people that are victim advocates and also all the legal specialists and staff people that work with us. We've got an office of 330 people. So are all of those downtown or where are they spread out? Well, that's a, an interesting um, conundrum. Um, they're kind of spread out. You know, initially they're spread out. Some okay. are in the Tim Curry Criminal Justice Center. Um, some are at Juvenile because we, of course, have cases with juvenile offenders. 
Some are officed in another location where they do Child Protective Services DFPS cases. And uh, some are in the family building simply because there's no space left in the Tim Curry building. So we're pretty spread out. Well, when I say spread out, I mean like some in South Lake, some no. in Hazel, some in, you know, so, so they're, but they're all. But you know, we do. Part of our office does represent uh, people, criminal cases, in front of the JP courts. So we do appear in those locations. We don't office there. Okay. So, but, so you're a criminal DA, but your office represents the people in civil matters, right? Yes. And so tell us what they do there. You know, um, so we represent every elected official. So that is the sheriff, the commissioners, the county judge, uh, the district and county clerks, the constables. Um, I always ask people whenever I'm talking to them, you know, guess who, who gets sued the most? We represent the tax assessor also. Who do you think? I, I, would, I would guess JPS, but that's probably wrong just because I happen to, to be part it's of actually, that. And, and we don't, we're not JPS's general counsel. Um, we have a contract with them to provide some legal services, but of course JPS has a separate general counsel under the law, it's not us. But when we look at the actual officials of the county, uh, the sheriff gets sued the most. Um, those aren't necessarily great lawsuits, but you know, when somebody's sitting in jail, they actually have access to... Um, they have nothing but time, right? <laughs> they have time and they have paper. So um, that's where a I lot can, of the lawsuits happen. I can imagine. I can imagine. But, it, you know, the civil side is so interesting. I tell people all the time, it's just so interesting because you remember a few years ago, two, three years ago, downtown, I'm gesturing to downtown, they were doing some construction down here and they found some Native American bones. Do you remember that? Because it was in the news. Uh, vaguely, I don't read anything. There's actually that. state laws about what you do when you find Native American bones. They have to be kept in a certain way and in a certain place and at some point they have to be reinterred. And that all happened in the last year. Um, and it's just interesting. You know, there's all kinds of uh, laws in Texas for almost every possible circumstance. Well, I, I, I think we've talked about it before, but. You know, we all do civil stuff, mm -hmm. so whenever I do well or don't do well, it, very rarely somebody goes to jail yeah. or is is executed or or continues to batter somebody else. Yeah. And it's just I I that whole world is is a, a scary world to me. It's 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 hard. Uh, well, so you handle the that that some of those civil things you handle you handle a lot of. Um, partner abuse, right? Yes. So the largest part of our office is, of course, the criminal cases. That's what everybody thinks about when they think about the DA's office. Right. Um, and and we're at our county's at two million people now, a little over two million. Um, and we have forty-one cities or parts of cities within Tarrant County. That makes our county unusual. You know, because when you think of Harris County, it's primarily Houston. Dallas is Dallas. They have some other cities, but we don't think anybody else has 41 cities 41. or parts of cities. And then when you add to that all the different agencies that have uh, police forces, BNSF Railway, um, all of our universities, the sheriff's office, um, they all have criminal police agencies. And every single one of those agencies, it's about 56, file their criminal cases into our office. In any given year, we'll review about 50,000 criminal complaints, criminal offense reports to decide whether or not there's a reason to file charges. And that ends up being about 45,000 cases filed a year on the criminal side. That's crazy to me. That's a lot of cases. It's a lot of cases. It's <laughs> well, a I'm, lot I'm of always cases. told if you, if you when you get out of law school, if you want to get a lot of trial court trial time immediately, you'll work for the district attorney, and you'll and that's be, really true. You'll be there in seconds. Because you know, so many of our civil cases, um, you know, with mandatory mediation, and you know, the, uh, the state bar had an article on the cover. You know, or, or is this the end of civil trials? You know, there's so many. Um, I always want to say to the to the judges that tell me I have to mediate. Could you show me where you get yeah. the power to just force me to mediate? I don't know. I don't see that anywhere. But uh, you do what you need to do, right? <laughs> um, 
The, well, let's let's take a break for a minute. We'll come back and we'll talk about protective orders. Okay. That's the, the only real question I get all the time, or not all the time, but sometimes is about protective orders. And so we'll be right back in a minute. Hang on, y'all. More with Warren when we get back. Welcome back, folks. You're listening to the White Hat Law Show with Warren Norris. Take it away, Warren. And we're back. So uh, I promised in that seductive tease that we're going to talk about protective orders. No pun intended. I don't know. I'm uh, sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're t- <laughs> maybe you should start over. I don't know. No. We're back. We're going to talk about protective orders. Um, all right, Sharon. Um, it's the only call that I get from already clients mm-hmm. sometimes usually for a friend, what do I do about my sister or my whatever who's, who's being, who's struggling with her abusive relationship and I have no idea what to tell them. So I understand you have mm-hmm. ways of handling this. Tell us about it. So protective orders are kind of the one, one phase of what we do when we deal with what we now refer to as intimate partner violence. So family violence involves the entire family. If brothers fight with each other or if it's a parent child, but intimate partner violence is kind of a subset. And it is typically, almost always, but not always, the male um, abusing or beating the female. So we know that there are some things that are true about those, that a man who strangles his wife or tries to cut off her or his loved one or tries to cut off her breathing is more likely than any other to shoot a police officer. Um, we know that in Tarrant County, our, our level of women being abused by men, by men was higher than the national average, almost 10% higher, we're one in three. And uh, nationally, the standard was one in four. One in three males? Is, Women okay, so would be the victim of abuse. One out of every three females is a victim of abuse. Yes. Wow. Shocking. Well, when you say, and you're a civil attorney, right? right? When you say that the most frequent call you get is for protective orders, that's because of domestic violence. Sure. That is the level of that violence in our community. And it's, it's a... Um, we, it's kind of, you have to approach it in several ways. One of them is with protective orders, right? So we know that as far as protective orders go, that, um, that they actually do work, um, that, a, that a woman or a, a man can get a protective order against the other person and, be, or, and that person be ordered by the court not to um, hurt the female or the male. Um, and the reason it works is because the studies have shown us that uh, domestic violence offenders are very self-controlled. Uh, they might be thinking all day long about how mad they are about something, but they don't do anything at work. They wait till they get home at night and beat their spouse. So it's a very self-controlled population and maybe why protective orders seem to work. And so lawyers can get protective orders, but for a person, they can also go online at tarrantcounty.com to our website and actually do an application for a protective order with our office. It, it doesn't cost them anything, and it will get their case and their circumstance before one of our attorneys who's experienced in this. Honestly, there may be an occasion where it gets reported and there's not enough to act on. If that person is just fed up, but the incident occurred months ago, right. that's not going to be sufficient for a protective order. So, but by making that application, we will contact them and uh, work with them to see if they need it, and also go with them to court if they do. So, how many applications for protective orders do you receive in a year? So, we're up to almost two thousand a year now, and that's about a forty percent increase since we uh, did all the application and everything online, um, which is a lot more work really for the attorneys in our office. And, and they just have a heart for this. I mean, these are really good lawyers, but they'll sit and talk to this person and perhaps uh, recommend um, services in the community that they can go get counseling if they need it. But they'll talk to them about what the legal requirements are and uh, try to make sure that if they need to get to court, we get them there. Well, the, so, I mean... That's really the civil side of this issue. Of course, on the criminal side, 
then we actually prosecute the people who have those those criminal cases filed. So what would take it over from from the time that the civil your civil guy says, ah, I think we'd probably head over across the hall and have somebody pick this guy up for something? Actually not. Um, the criminal cases come to us from the police department. Really? So it's um, typically somebody files a protective order um, or requests a protective order, or perhaps they've called the police because they've been hurt, and the police officer suggests to them that they get a protective order. So they really come to our office from independent means. Police, I guess that's, from your perspective, it's, a, it's an independent means. Um, and so, so you issue about 2,000. About how many applications do you get? I mean, are those, I mean, 4,000 That's people? actually 2,000 requests. 2,000 requests. And so, and from those, there's some subset that actually Right. There's wind up fewer being, that are actually filed. Right. I was curious as to how often it's, you decide to, hey, you know, you probably ought to um, just move out and we're not going to do an order on this case. I mean, is that 80%, 20%? I wouldn't, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. I don't know what the actual number is that are filed. Um, I don't know the answer to that. And so often, whenever, whenever I'm talking to somebody, mm -hmm. I have my counselor hat on just for a minute, and I say, you know, you're allowed to get out of there. That's, That's something you could probably say that we couldn't. Really? You can't say that? You know, we might tell them they're at risk. I mean, there's actually risk assessments out there for domestic violence, and, um, and we know about those because, honestly, Dallas County started doing a lot of good work on domestic violence and intimate partner violence years before we did. And um, there's some risk assessments where, based on some answers to some questions, I think the police officer or us can tell somebody, you know, if you don't get out, he's going to kill you. Yeah, there's some predictors here. Yes, there are. What was it there? I read somewhere, I just make things up sometimes, uh, like the average time that where you have a woman that's been killed, police have been out there five times or something like that. It's, it's usually not a, the first a time. big surprise that this happened. And so it's, it's very rare when somebody's going to go from zero to 100 in seconds. It's usually some steps in the middle there that kind of tell you something. Um, but crime, we were saying earlier, is up generally. It is, and it's really because of the population. I don't think anyone in our county feels less safe. Um, because we haven't had like an uh, increase in any particular kind of crime, we just have a huge increase in population. And with an increase in population comes a corresponding increase in crime generally, just because people are people, right? Well, no, so, so, is, so is crime up per capita, or is that a question that you know the answer to? Or I, don't is it know just, the, I don't know the answer to that. Because well, I guess the question is, if, as, a, as our density increases, I can imagine that crime increases just with density, uh, because people are just too close to each other. You know, out in the hinterlands, nobody, it's hard to have crime because nobody's talking to anybody else, right? But if you interacting with hundreds of people, you live in 10,000 people per square mile, it starts to get more difficult. Okay, well there are actually populations where they have an increase in crime without a corresponding increase in, or increase in population without a corresponding increase in crime, but it's like Florida. Right? right? Because there are some populations that when they increase, for example, people over the age of 50, right. they Crime takes a lot of effort. And, <laughs> you know, it's like, I'm so done. Can I? <laughs> it's just not worth it. I don't care that much. I don't want to commit this crime. Ugh. And you know, there's a whole criminology st uh, oh, right. study about, you know, people aging out of their criminality at a certain point. Well, there's, you know, I wouldn't, again, I'm no, no expert. I just, I just mutter things unless you correct me. Um, my understanding is, generally speaking, crime rates follow the number of young men you have. Uh, and if you have young men as a growing population, then you're going to have more crime. And by the time people hit 40, when men hit mm -hmm. about 40, they start going, that was a lot of work. It's just too much work. <laughs> I'm just going to get a job, you know, so <laughs> get a job and, and just go back, just do that. Um, is, is there any truth to that or do you, is that something that... Uh, I think there is truth to that. I think there's entire courses in, in colleges built around that scenario and what are the studies about who commits crime and what are the factors? There's something else told me, someone told me once, I have run this by you, that if, you, if, a, um, if a bureaucrat or a, an office, a policy holder, a policy maker in an urban, in an area wants to, wants to make crime appear, have more crime, they hire more police officers because then more criminal reports get filed and if you 
have fewer police officers, then you can make it look as though your crime is going down because people get tired of putting up with the weight and they just go on about their business. And if they can put up with not having to report it, they don't. I have never heard that. I think that um, the fallacy might be, um, for example, in, in Dallas County where they don't have very many police or they have a shortage of police officers, as I hear on the news, I have no inside knowledge. Um, you know, I think they're concerned about their response times, the crime that's going on. I think, and, um, you know, I don't know that I would attribute that to any elected officials, you know, desire to change the crime rate. I don't know that it's necessarily uh, a, a deliberate thing, uh, but I just, that's all I'd ask, because I've heard that before, and I said, well, that almost makes sense, you know, if that, but... What do okay, I know? Okay, well, yeah. so if we're just gonna talk in criminal theory, you remember when Rudy Giuliani was, took over as mayor of New York, and New York was crime-ridden, New York City, crime-ridden. People didn't wanna go there. They certainly didn't wanna to go to Times Square. And he started following this criminal justice theory called broken windows. Right. Right? Right. Where you get a lot of police on the street and you stop everything. Um, the broken window being, if the window in a house is broken, Today it's broken, tomorrow somebody's in there and broken inside and right. ransacked it or they're living in it and then it's a drug house. So you stop with the broken window, right? Right. Which I am guessing increased the amount of arrest and crime and all that in New York City. It also made a huge difference in sure. the livability of that city. I mean, what you hope is you have this big bump and you, then you establish, then, yeah. establish normal behavior as, and as a requirement and then you get past that. Um, well, let's take another break in a minute, and we'll come back and talk about in, in, in conviction integrity, because that right. sounds like a cool phrase we should hear more about. We'll be right back. Hang on, y'all. More with Warren when we get back. Welcome back, folks. You're listening to the White Hat Law Show with Warren Norris. Take it away, Warren. Welcome back. We're talking to Sharon Wilson, the Tarrant County Criminal District Attorney, <laughs> and not all that other stuff. Anyway, sorry. Uh, <laughs> We were talking about conviction integrity. What is conviction integrity? Conviction integrity, on the, the easiest way to explain it is just to make sure that if a person is convicted, that it was a lawful conviction. Not only that he's guilty, but that due process was afforded him, procedural justice. Those are important concepts, especially in criminal law, where the penalties can be so severe, right? Right. Um, a lot of people think of conviction integrity as actual innocence. And of course, there's the Innocence Project and all those efforts nationwide. And we know a lot about that in the Metroplex because Dallas um, was the site of more exonerations than any other county in the United States, right? The Dallas. Right. So um, in Tarrant County, when I took over, we opened our Conviction Integrity Unit. At the time, it was the 17th one in the nation. Um, and Leading edge. There you go. Well, it was, it was important. Yeah, sure. You know, we had, and, and when we started it, it wasn't because there was any belief that we had convicted a bunch of innocent people in Tarrant County. Nobody thought that or believed it, and I think that that's still the correct thing. We haven't. We've actually had one case where um, the person has been released. He hasn't been exonerated at this point, but he was released from a murder conviction um, because of procedural problems in his case. And specifically, um, he had a, in that case, the testimony against him included testimony from a jailhouse informant, which is a person who's just in jail and is there next to the cell with the right. defendant and, and then sends out a note, says, I've got testimony. I've, this guy's been telling me what he did. If right. you'll dismiss my case, I'll testify against him. And so his testimony, the jailhouse informant's testimony, was used to convict this man um, here in Tarrant County. And, and the testimony was that he had never done that before. He was not a typical jailhouse informant. Um, it was a one-time thing, and that was a lie. Mm. He'd actually done it several times before. Um, and amazingly, he always got his case dismissed or, you know, very low. Well, the problem was... It's working the system. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> The problem for us was um, that the prosecutor who tried that case had no way of knowing that in an office our size in one of the other 10 felony courts 
this guy had testified in another case. There's no way to know. Right. And so it wasn't prosecutorial misconduct. It was just a procedural problem, right? right. We agreed that he should be released, and actually when we started testing all the evidence, we are unable to prove that he actually committed that offense. We've been working very closely with the police department, who have been excellent, because they don't want innocent people convicted either. Um, that was interesting, because as soon as that happened, and we started analyzing that with our Conviction Integrity Unit, um, we developed a policy within our office that if any lawyer in that office wants to use a jailhouse informant, they have one clearinghouse, one person who keeps all the names, all the instances, the transcripts, so that you know if you're going to use this person, he either did it before, and right. we can provide that to the defense attorneys and they can use it for cross-examination. And then two years ago, the legislature took that policy and ma made it a state law. Outstanding. It was great. Right. And, you know, that's what you want with a conviction integrity unit. You want to actually be able to look at individual cases, make sure that they're right, and if they're not, how do we fix that? Well, we certainly don't want prosecutors who, who are graded on the number of, uh, on the number of people they've, they've put away, right? And that's, that's the kind of the, the thing that you hear, right? That you uh -huh. hear, well, you know, they're just trying to keep their stats up. And... I just I hate that. That's just horrible. It's funny you say that because somebody asked me the other day if we um, what our what our win loss ratio was, and I said we don't keep it and we will never keep it because it, when, when people start <laughs> thinking I've got to win this case so I can get a promotion or you know right it makes it makes people do messy things. Well, you got to ask you what, what is the mission statement? I always like to know what the mission statement is. Right? Is the mission statement? to people behind bars? Is that the mission mm -hmm. statement? Or what is, what is the mission statement? We actually right? have a mission statement, what? and it is to enforce the civil and criminal laws in a just and ethical manner. You know, there's an other parts about transparency, but the big part is, that's what right. we do. We enforce civil and criminal laws in a just and ethical manner. Well, I'm glad to hear that because, uh, well, I'm glad to hear that for lots of reasons. <laughs> <laughs> The uh, the last thing that I know, we, we talked earlier, and I wanted to make sure you had a chance to talk about uh, deferred prosecution, right on crime issues. Talk mm -hmm. to us about that. You know, I not everyone who has a criminal case needs to be in custody. You know, there are people who have criminal charges, and we have in Tarrant County, um, with our court system, lots of diversion programs. There's a veterans program. We just started a first responder program. There's, you know, mental health, veteran, we already said veterans, DWI programs to try to get people, drug court programs, to try to get people out of the system um, into treatment or whatever they need so that they can go on and lead a productive life. Tim Curry, back in 1974, way ahead of his time, started a program in the DA's office, not a court program, a DA's office program called Deferred Prosecution, and it was for youthful offenders. Um, who could change their own behavior. You know, you get caught and you're like, oh no, you know, I will never do that again. And actually, there's a large segment of our population that's that. Right. Um, or they're young I enough. I thought I could get away with it, but it turns out I can't, <laughs> and I'm not doing that. Yeah, that was a I sad tale. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or their parents are horrified to find out that this has happened, and they're about to take care of it, right? right. Yeah. So, youthful offenders. The, the only concern with that program was uh, that it was uh, primarily, it had got, for some, for some reasons, it had kind of uh, been primarily a program for young white males. Well, you know, most of the youthful offenders everywhere, including in Tarrant County, are young African American males. And so we looked at that program, I actually got a, a work group together with people in our office, people with the defense bar, to, to say, why is this not working? And we changed some of the parameters, easy changes. And that program is now like 70% African-American or minority. And that's how it ought to be, because now it's more reflective of the actual population that's eligible. And that's how it ought to be. Um, this is a great program because it has a very high success rate, like in the 80%. And when when people go through that program, they don't have a conviction, they don't have jail time, they can get an expunction when it's over with, and they can go on with their lives and go to school, get jobs, and, and be productive members of our right. society, which is what we want. Right. The, uh, I, it, we hadn't talked about this. I, I just 
there's a lot of discussion about people that are that are in trouble for small amounts of marijuana. Yes. And we have a lot of this ongoing discussion about decriminalization in the state and all over the country. Do you have any opinions on that that you want to share with us, or you know, or should I just go ahead and cut it off here? <laughs> I don't know. I'm just I'm just asking. Okay, can we talk in then? <laughs> That's that. Um, okay, so um, you know, philosophically, is marijuana um, should it be legalized? And in my opinion, no. And I think that when I talk to my other law enforcement partners, law uh, police agencies, people who have done criminal justice in states where it is legalized, it has not been good for society. Okay. Um, having said that. People who have marijuana cases don't need to go to the pen. Right. You know, young, small amounts of marijuana, youthful offenders. You know, these people do not need to be um, incarcerated. There are all kinds of programs. Yeah, but there's, the, there but is the a step is, between yes, full legalization and, yes, you know, let's hand Diversion it out. programs. Right. And, and I think that's really what you've seen us focus on here in Tarrant County is diversion programs to get youthful or small amounts, I say youthful, but small amounts of marijuana possessions out of the criminal justice system. The truth is getting those people diverted out of the criminal justice system is better for everybody because yeah. I have limited resources, right. right? I don't need to spend it on somebody who really just needs to know that that's not a good lifestyle. Right, right. I, well, it's the idea, I mean, I, I like, I'm kind of Old Testament about things. You know, let's let's, let's uh, ship people out of the country or, <laughs> Or let's cut off a hand. I, I, I just want to get, I want punishment to be done and over as quickly as possible. But there, we're not really set up to do that kind of thing anymore. Mm -hmm. We just aren't. And so um, the idea of putting somebody in jail when there are real criminals, serious criminals, yes. that they can hang out with every day, it just seems like a horrible thing to do. Um, so I'm, I'm glad to hear, to, to see this the direction of getting people out of the jail I don't, you know, so we don't pay. How much does, it, much does it cost to keep somebody I in? I think the sheriff will say $50 a day, something like that. That's, that's just a lot person. of money to, to have them do nothing useful. I mean, it's just crazy talk. So, um, well, Sharon, thank you very much for, for coming by and visiting with us. Um, you're always great. And you're always Thanks. welcome. We can come back and talk mental health someday. I know it's everybody's Let's favorite do. topic these days. But I'd love to. So we'll do that another time. Okay, and, and so thank you for joining us, One Hat Law. Um, that's Sharon Wilson, the Criminal District Attorney of Tarrant <laughs> County. And we'll see you next time. Take care. Well, that's a wrap, folks. And we want to thank you for listening to the White Hat Law Show here with Warren Nord. To find out more about Warren, check him out at nordlaw.com. See you next time. <laughs>